failure is a way of life in Gotham City. After all, we're talking about the most crime-ridden, corrupt, and dangerous streets in the entire country. In Gotham, failure seeps up from the subway grates and rains down on its embittered, callous population from the dark, polluted skies above. Indeed, the only way to succeed in Gotham is to throw your hat in with the criminals and double-dealing officials that own this town. So while we sit back and count down the Dark Knight's detective's darkest deeds, we have to keep in mind that this is a man fighting a losing war. Batman never wins. Batman never truly saves the city. His promise to rescue Gotham City from itself always ultimately ends in failure because Gotham City is, and always was, beyond saving. So when we talk about Batman's worst deeds, we can't talk about his biggest failures as the Big Bad Bat, only about his biggest failures as a man. The times Batman chose his mission over those around him. The times he refused to listen to his humanity over his perceived duty. Those times Batman failed to save the people that were most important to him, or worse, the times he failed to prepare them to save themselves. Number 10. Lied to the Family About Joker When the Joker returned to terrorize the Bat family in the now famous Death of the Family story arc, everyone could tell that something was different. And when Mr. J finally revealed himself to Batman at the Gotham Reservoir, he divulged something truly horrifying that would shake the Bat family to its very core. That Joker knows their secret identities. After this dark revelation, the family meets in the cave and begs Bruce to be straight with them about what the Joker may or may not know. To satisfy their questions, Bruce tells the story of one of his very first battles with Joker in which the Clown Prince of Crime escaped into Gotham Bay. I searched the bay for hours, trying to find some sign of him, but there was nothing, he explains. When Batman returned to the cave and awoke the next morning, he found one of Joker's calling cards floating in the water of the Batcave. This, understandably, sends ripples of shock and disbelief through Batman's sidekicks, as they had grown up believing that the cave, and by extension their lives, were completely safe. The family is, to put it mildly, quite pissed with their mentor for not sharing a detail that could possibly help keep them alive. This lie of omission on Batman's part would prove to be catastrophic as the rest of the Death of the Family event sees the Joker individually capturing and torturing the Bat family in ways that prove he is all too privy to their alter egos. When everything is said and done, all of Batman's sidekicks and partners would start to distance themselves from their mentor. This breach of trust proved too much for the family to bear, and for a time, Batman would find himself well and truly alone isolated by his own lack of faith and candor with those he loves the most. Though it was a decision with devastating consequences, Bruce believed himself truly in the right when he decided not to tell the family about the possibility of Joker's infiltration. Batman believes he has the right to decide what information those around him need to know, but this arrogance has lost him allies before and, in the case of the Joker, nearly lost him the family he spent so long building up around him. Number 9. Asking John Paul Valley to be Batman Usually, as we'll see, Batman's mistakes are made out of a lack of trust or by unforeseen circumstances derailing one of his meticulous plans. It is an exceedingly rare moment when Batman, unforced, makes a gigantic error in judgment. And yet, over the course of his long history, it certainly has happened before. Take the example of Jean-Paul Valley, otherwise known as Azrael, a physiologically troubled man with close ties to an ancient order of assassins. When the venomized Bane actually managed to break Batman's spine, Bruce Wayne was well and truly paralyzed, unable to attend his duties as the Bat. In this absence, acting Robin Tim Drake suggested that a substitute Batman might be in order to help keep Gotham from plunging into the dark. Tim's original candidate was the obvious choice, Dick Grayson, who would eventually take up the cowl much later after Bruce's apparent death. But Batman insisted that Dick was his own man now, with his own responsibilities. With that, the mantle of the Bat went to the next most viable candidate, longtime ally but severely troubled John Paul Valley. Valley quickly established himself as a much less forgiving and far more violent Batman than Bruce ever was. But Valley's final straw would be during a run in with the rampant serial killer Abattoir. Having tracked Abattoir to the edge of town, Valley ignored all safety and consequence in his zealous quest to apprehend the killer. Not only was Valley uninterested in investigating the warehouse, his frenzied rush to find his prey caused him to almost flatten a bystander with the Batmobile as he sped through the streets. When he arrived, his negligence and one-track mind failed to register the hostage Abattoir was torturing in the basement. Adorned in his terrifying mecha bat suit, Jean-Paul loses all control once he comes within spitting distance of Abattoir. The Batman even seems to revel in the way his prey squirms and runs as he slowly but surely closes in for the endgame. When Batman faces Abattoir on the rafters of a nearby warehouse, he says, Do it, Abattoir. Take your best swing. But it won't matter. You're already dead. With this, he hurls himself at the serial killer, sending both careening over the edge. 
Abattoir is left dangling by one hand from a chain above a roiling pit of molten liquid. Jean-Paul's mind finally begins to crack as he becomes overwhelmed with the weight of the decision he faces, whether to save his enemy or let the evildoer fall to his death. A distraught Robin watches as Jean-Paul, the acting Batman, lets Abattoir fall to his death, doing nothing to save the man. And at that very moment, across the street, the hostage that Jean-Paul failed to save dies as a final weight falls and cracks his chest. But before we get on to any more of Batman's debacles, be sure to subscribe to the channel with notifications on to never miss an upload and smash that like button for some plot armor today. Now, without further ado, let's see what Bruce manages to bungle next. Number 8. Tortured the Mad Hatter Batman has a lot of rules. The strict oaths that the Bat lives under aren't just for show. They're there to make sure that Batman never falls too far into the darkness of his city to make sure that he never loses sight of his goals in favor of his emotions. The bold lines that Batman draws in the sand are there to give him actionable, easily marked boundaries beyond which he cannot go, or else become something much uglier than a force for justice. There are, of course, moments when Batman decides not to save someone. As we'll see a little later down the list, this isn't one of those moments. This is a moment where Batman lost control of himself to his more base emotions. A moment in which he stared into the void that is Gotham City and very nearly let it engulf him. Batman lives his life with the power to permanently end the lives of those who terrorize his city, and every night he has to choose not to exercise that power. Every night, Batman walks a high wire, trying to balance justice with revenge, trying not to justify the means with the ends. And sometimes the things that finally threaten to push us over the edge come from the most unlikely sources. Such was it that Batman's lesser known but no less freaky villains, the Mad Hatter, very nearly drove the Dark Knight detective past the point of no return. When the criminally insane cosplayer Jarvis Tech kidnapped the Ukrainian concert pianist Natalia Trusevich to be the twisted newest incarnation of Alice, little did he know that Natalia and local billionaire Bruce Wayne had just started seeing one another and were growing increasingly close. When Natalia refused to act alone in Jarvis' scheme, the Hatter tortured her bitterly before dropping her from a rooftop directly on top of the bat signal, killing her instantly. When Batman discovered her body, the rage that overcame Bruce was unlike anything Commissioner Gordon had ever seen from him before. Battling his way through the Hatter's army of mind-controlled goons, when Bats finally found Jarvis, his patience had all but run out. Batman's rage boiling over in his ears, he proceeds to give Jarvis a beating like none the Batman had ever doled out before. It doesn't take a detective to see that the Mad Hatter isn't exactly a heavyweight champion. This is not a villain that possibly sizes up to Batman in terms of raw physicality and strength. So when I tell you that Batman did not hold back while beating the Mad Hatter to a pulp, you can imagine how unnecessary it was for Batman to use his full strength. Bats beat the living crap out of Jarvis without a single ounce of mercy in his eyes. No punches were pulled as Batman wailed on the Hatter, eventually just pummeling his adversary into the ground again and again. Eventually, a dizzying uppercut from Batman sent the Hatter careening into a nearby pool where the brutalized Jarvis sank like a stone, soon to drown. As Jarvis sank, Batman turned away to leave the Hatter to his fate, effectively killing the criminal himself. In that most crucial of moments, only Alfred was able to get through to Bruce, pleading with him not to become like the criminals and killers he dedicated his life to stopping. In a moment of strength and clarity, Batman returned and fished the Hatter from the pool, saving his life. Should this moment have gone differently, if Bruce had crossed that line, who knows what would have become of the Batman and how many other criminals might have died by his hands. Number 7. Brutal Training of Robin From Dick Grayson's earliest days at the Wayne Manor to Damian Wayne's troubled first years working alongside his father, many comic creators have taken a crack at what the process of training the numerous boy wonders would have looked like behind the scenes. Most of those depictions, unsurprisingly, do not look flatteringly upon the Dark Knight detective. One of the most successful adaptations of Robin's training comes to us from Jeff Lemire and Dustin Nguyen's recent Robin and Batman 3-issue miniseries. Through the eyes of a young Dick Grayson, Lemire and Nguyen take an honest, genuine look at what it would take to train a young boy into a sidekick capable of keeping stride with the great and terrible Batman. After a test outing, which Dick is almost overwhelmed by a number of criminals, the strained relationship between the mentor and student finally snaps and Dick shouts at Bruce, This is bull! I'm tired of stupid training exercises! You said I could be your partner! After the outburst, Alfred and Bruce are left alone in the cave and Bruce justifies pushing his young ward to the very edge. This only works if he has the armor he needs to survive out there. I won't put a child in danger. He needs to become something more. 
To which Alfred deftly replies, Would it hurt to show the boy a bit of compassion? Just a little leniency. Bruce, as always, has an answer ready for his most trusted ally. Leniency would have gotten him killed by the truck driver. Leniency would mean me bringing home a dead child. Turning a child into a warrior was never going to be easy, of course, but Alfred of all people knows what happens when a kid isn't allowed to experience adolescence at all. Ultimately, Batman's merciless approach to training his partner prevents Dick from any chance of enjoying a warm, loving childhood ever again. Furthermore, through his training regimens, Batman inadvertently passes on his own trust issues and paranoia to his adopted son, teaching the boy to never fully let anyone in and always be on the highest of guards. This was never more evident than on Robin's first trip to the Watchtower, where he first met the sidekicks of the rest of the Justice League. Dick's first meeting with the heroes that would eventually become the Teen Titans went off without a hitch. He and his new friends would of course sneak out of the Watchtower to enjoy some grand adventures, but it wouldn't be until Robin and Batman returned to the cave that the true meaning of Robin's outing would become clear. As Robin gleefully relays the day's adventures to Alfred, Batman orders, Robin, mission debrief. Immediately, Robin begins carefully and stoically listing all of his sidekicks he met that day and outlines their weaknesses and possible points of vulnerability in battle. Robin outlines essentially how he would go about defeating the Teen Titans if he was called to do so. Batman approves of his report, but Alfred is disgusted by this display of blind paranoia. They are children, Alfred pleads with Bruce. Children like him. Why can't you just let him have that? Batman gruffly responds, I never did. Why should he? With that, Alfred sees the dark truth behind all of the talk of safety and responsibility. You bastard, he says as he storms off. Number 6. Left KG Beast to Die When the infamous Russian super assassin KGB Beast was hired to kill Batman's first son Nightwing, he knew that doing so would put him at the very top of Batman's hit list. What he didn't know at the time is just how far Batman was willing to go to get revenge. The assassin tracked Nightwing to Gotham from his usual home of Bloodhaven and found the perfect sniper perch from a window overlooking the roof of the GCPD building. Eventually, KGB Beast knew Nightwing would arrive on Batman's coattails to meet with their old ally, Commissioner Gordon. The mercenary got his wish, though he would later regret it. When Batman and Nightwing arrived at the GCPD, KGB Beast wasted no time in taking his shot. One perfectly placed bullet connected with the side of Nightwing's skull, and in the blink of an eye, the former boy Wonder had collapsed with a bullet lodged inside of his brain. In the aftermath of Nightwing's shooting and subsequent coma, Batman did something that would chill the blood of even the most cold-hearted killer. He left Gotham hunting KGB Beast to the freezing tundra. It was clear that something had changed in Batman's demeanor. Something about the man was darker and more menacing than he had ever been before. When Bruce inevitably found the beast holed away in a cabin at the edge of the world, there would be no infiltration, no smoke bombs to hide his arrival. Batman wanted KGB Beast to know that he was coming and to know that it was over. The beast time was up. The battle between Batman and the beast would be one of the most vicious fights either had ever been a part of the world's foremost assassin against the Gargoyle of Gotham. Just as the Beast seemed poised to finish the bat once and for all, Batman retrieved his grapple gun from his belt and fired directly up at KG Beast's chin. The snap that echoed through the tundra told Batman all he needed to know, that the Beast's neck was broken. If you get me help, I will tell you who hired me to kill your boy. The mercenary managed as he bled into the snow piling up around him. Batman didn't even look at the Beast as he answered, I'm the world's greatest detective. I'll find who hired you and I'll break them too. You can get your own damn help." Before leaving the helpless beast to freeze in the snow. This obviously represents one of the only times that Batman has ever intentionally left someone to their death. Long has the debate raged about whether or not Batman leaving someone to die constitutes a breach of his oath never to kill. But wherever that debate lands, it's undoubtedly clear that Batman's treatment of KGB Beast does measure up to a failure by the standards Bruce holds himself to. In this specific instance though, because KGB Beast attempted to kill Batman's own son, it's a failure that Bruce is willing to live with. Another reminder that there is nothing Batman wouldn't do to save his family, even breaking his own rules. Number 6. The Final Fight with Superman Though the Dark Knight and the Man of Steel have gone up against one another countless times throughout comic book history, perhaps no battle was more emotionally charged and poignant than their clash in the final pages of Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. When Batman effectively takes control of Gotham City to instill some form of rule of law, the US government sends their prized errand boy Superman to deal with that pesky Batman once and for all. Bruce, ever the strategist, even in his advanced age, knew that their confrontation was inevitable, and he meticulously planned every second of their encounter. When Superman asks Bruce simply where, by carving the letters at Bruce's feet from space, there could only be one answer, Crime Alley. 
This failure wouldn't be like any of the others Bruce had made in his life. This was a planned failure, a choreographed loss. Batman knew he had to disappear, that the government would no longer tolerate any dissent from do-gooders looking to make the world a little safer. We include this moment as one of Batman's darkest deeds not because it was avoidable nor because it led to some great and cataclysmic disaster, but simply because this was a fight driven by Batman's ego, not by his mission. Violence for the sake of violence. After being briefly fired on by Robin driving a tank, Batman and Superman finally met on the darkened street where Thomas and Martha Wayne died. In true Bruce Wayne poetic fashion, Batman's suit had been plunged into the Gotham City grid and was drawing energy from the entire city at once, which gave him just about a fighting chance against a Superman who had recently only barely survived a nuclear explosion. The battle between the two would be wrought with pain and emotion. Two bastions of a bygone age fighting one last time to see who was right. I want you to remember my hand at your throat, Bruce thinks while his heart finally begins to give way. I want you to remember the one man who beat you. Ultimately, Bruce's plan went off without a hitch. To the world, it would look like Superman drove the Dark Knight detective's weakened body to the brink until it simply shut down. Even Superman himself believed in his own responsibility for a time, and the pills Bruce had ingested to keep his body in a catatonic state would only kick in after the funeral, allowing him to retire to his cave for the rest of his life. Though Batman's plan succeeded, his intentions were undeniably less than honorable. Using Superman to fake his own death and blaming his demise on his former friend is not an honorable heroic move. In fact, it was downright dirty. But it was the only move that Bruce had left and the old man played it to perfection. Number 5. The Death of Stephanie Brown Not the first Robin to die and certainly not the last, Stephanie Brown's brutal death at the hands of Black Mask would nonetheless leave a lasting mark on the entire Bat family and Bruce in particular. Though the death of his sons Jason Todd and Damian Wayne, which we'll get to later, may have been in some ways more traumatic for Batman, the way in which Stephanie died would haunt Bruce no less fervently. Her demise would not only be an era-defining tragedy for Batman, it would also teach the Dark Knight an all-important lesson in how his methods can inadvertently do harm to those closest to him with disastrous results. Historically, most of the individuals that have operated as Batman have been brought into the world of vigilantism by Batman himself. But in this, as in most things, Stephanie is the exception to the rule. Stephanie Brown, most well-known by her original codename Spoiler, was a lion-hearted, earnest, and driven young woman to whom nothing was ever handed. Unlike most of Batman's partners who were grandfathered in by association to Batman, Stephanie would have to fight and earn her spot in the Bat family all on her own, without any fancy Batmobile or million-dollar utility belt. Starting out as a spoiler, with just a costume and a passion for helping people, Stephanie would eventually strike up a close romantic relationship with one Tim Drake. Though Tim's hiatus from the role of Robin would be one catalyst that drove Stephanie to the role and her eventual doom. When Tim's father learned of his son's nightly activities, the third Robin was forced to hang up his cape and cowl for a time. With Batman working Robin less, Stephanie soon showed up at the Batcave in a homemade costume and all but demanded that Batman train her to become his sidekick, the first female Robin, but certainly not the last. Batman accepts Stephanie's proposal, citing her determination and believing she would be an excellent replacement for Tim. Stephanie would train at the hands of Batman for months before Bruce would allow her into the field under his supervision. Eventually, after being fired for disobeying orders in order to save Batman's life, Stephanie makes a desperate plea to win back Bruce's favor and prove once and for all that she has what it takes. Upon discovering one of Batman's many contingency plans to eliminate all gang violence in Gotham, Stephanie activates the plot without realizing that the entire plan hinges on Batman's involvement as his undercover alibi matches Malone. The result would be a disaster. A shootout between the gangs of Gotham breaks out during the secret meeting Stephanie put into place. With dead on all sides, Gotham is plunged into an all-out gang war that would grow to a fever pitch and at one point threaten to take down the entire city. Stephanie seeks out Black Mask in an effort to take out the very top of the Gotham food chain and stop the gang war at its source, but in the midst of the battle, she would be shot, taken captive, and later tortured by Black Mask and his gang. Though Stephanie would eventually escape Black Mask on her own accord, Batman finds her stumbling over the rooftops in critical condition. Rushing the wounded Stephanie to the neighborhood clinic of Leslie Tompkins, Batman tells Stephanie, Everything you've done, everything you've been through, this city owes you, and so do I. Stephanie would later die in that same hospital bed with Batman at her side. A poignant and tragic lesson to Bruce that pushing people away can often put them in more danger than holding them close. Number 4. JLA Tower of Babel Of Batman's numerous character flaws, perhaps none is more pervasive and poisonous than his chronic lack of trust. 
And never was this trait more on display than during the disastrous events of the Justice League of America story arc The Tower of Babel. Later adapted into the successful animated movie Justice League Doom, in this arc, Batman's contingency plans for each member of the JLA are stolen by the immortal cultist Ra's al Ghul and used to cripple the team. First, Roz abducts the bodies of Thomas and Martha Wayne from their gravesite to distract the bat as his operatives around the globe led by his daughter Talia al Ghul take down the Justice League one by one. First, the Martian Manhunter is attacked, ambushed more like it, by a single missile dispersing some sort of nanotech cloud around the alien. Ingeniously, as Flash and Wonder Woman discover while fighting the subsequent forest fire, the nanites rewrite Martian Manhunter's very skin into a magnesium-based compound that ignites on contact with air. Essentially, as Superman aptly notes, turning Martian Manhunter into a living torch. Fire being a Martian's most dangerous weakness, this completely incapacitates John Jones and prevents the Manhunter from any further operations. The attack certainly would have killed the hero had Wonder Woman and Flash not seen to his swift rescue. Meanwhile, as Plastic Man and Aquaman defend against an attack on the United Nations, Plastic Man's body is frozen solid with a specialized weapon making the Elastic Hero extremely vulnerable to anything that shatters his brittle form. As Aquaman jumps to his defense, however, Arthur finds himself breathing in the strange fumes as another specialized rock barrels into his chest. When Arthur begins to recover from the hit, he recoils in fear at the sight of water, as a specialized compound of fear toxin begins to permeate his system. A particularly pernicious problem arises when your Atlantean physiology requires water for your very survival. Wonder Woman and the Flash run off to check on Green Lantern, who had yet to check in. They find him sitting in his apartment, apparently struck down with blindness. Unable to see the world around him, the Green Lantern wallows in his room, unable to use his power ring for anything useful while his eyesight eludes him. While Batman confronts Ra's al Ghul about stealing his dead parents, talk about adding insult to injury, the Flash and Wonder Woman are attacked while trying to calm a beside himself Green Lantern. Ra's forces fire a nanite similar to the ones used against the Martian Manhunter that crawls into Wonder Woman's ear and attaches to her brainstem. The Biobot causes Wonder Woman to collapse, trapped in intense lifelike dreams of being locked in battle against a powerful opponent, while in reality, Diana's teammates are unable to rouse her from her feverish slumber. For the Flash, a more direct approach is favored as a vibratory projectile, simply put, a very tricky bullet is shot into the speedster's spinal column and begins to inflict Wally West with consecutive light speed seizures. When the Man of Steel himself arrives to save the JLA from Talia's forces, even Superman falls victim to a contingency designed just for him. As Superman begins to make his way towards Talia, she reveals a hunk of red kryptonite. Superman predictably falls to his knees at the exposure, but something strange and unique occurs too. Rather than just temporarily depowering the hero, the red form of the kryptonite causes Soup's skin to turn entirely transparent. Needless to say, eventually the League was able to take down Ra's and end his nefarious schemes, but not before the damage had been done. Once Batman revealed that the plans used to neutralize the League were of Bruce's own creation, many in the League couldn't find it within their hearts to forgive him. The Tower of Babel incident would lead to one of the League's most intense and difficult fights up to that point, the consequences of which would be dire. When at the end of it all, the JLA held a vote on whether or not to allow Batman to stay on the team. Bats didn't so much as wait to hear their answer. When they returned to let him know their verdict, the Batman was gone. Number 3. Created Brother Eye If the Tower of Babel was the smoke, then Brother Eye was the fire. When Batman created the worldwide surveillance system designed to spy and quietly collect data on every known metahuman on the planet, he did so because he felt he couldn't trust those around him anymore. After the disastrous events of Identity Crisis in which Batman had his memory wiped by those he once called friends, Bruce grew ever more distrustful of those around him. This increased paranoia drove Batman to invent the Brother Eye system and collect a secret database containing all known information on every superhero and metahuman to walk the Earth. Its files include the weaknesses, histories, and close affiliates of every supervillain and superhero on the planet. It was only a matter of time before the information Bats collected was used for evil and the Tower of Babel was only the beginning. Ra's al Ghul had hijacked into Brother Eye and taken only what he wanted, the files pertaining how to neutralize the League. But something far more sinister was hiding under the surface. Ted Kord, the second Blue Beetle, was the first to feel like someone else was watching. He was the first to guess that, as Brother Eye watched everyone, someone else was watching him. Of course, almost no one believed Ted at first, especially not Batman, whose ego prevented him from believing that a hack of that magnitude could ever be pulled off without his notice. Brother Eye was Batman's Ultron, an idea that led Bruce down the tragic road of believing the only way to ensure the protection of the world is by controlling all of its variables at once, the means justified by an end. Eventually, Ted tracked the Brother Eye hack back to one Maxwell Lord, a longtime businessman and villainous mastermind. 
As Mr. Lord's infiltration of Batman's database serves as a kickoff for the entire Infinite Crisis event, we unfortunately don't have space here to go through all of the consequences of the creation of Brother Eye. Not least of which was the creation of Omax, a group of nigh unstoppable killing machines that would give anyone who controlled them power over the world itself. But perhaps most tragically is that Ted Kord himself was murdered while investigating Lord's plans, blood that very clearly falls on Batman's own paranoid hands. Number 2. Couldn't Save Damian Wayne We're sure there are plenty of debates that rage across the Bat fandom, arguing over which of his son's deaths was hardest on Bruce. For our purposes, considering our job at this moment requires us to rank them, we will put the death of Damian Wayne in the number 2 spot and save the first spot for you know who. This is for one simple reason. Batman would eventually revive Damien, not only succeeding in rescuing his son, but redeeming himself for his failure as well. He never got that chance with the other martyr in his family. But even still, there was a time, a brief moment in Batman's history when his biological son lay dead at his feet. When Damien's mother, Talia al Ghul, sent an adult clone of her son nicknamed the Heretic to attack Gotham, Damien felt a deeply personal responsibility for taking down this threat from his mother. At the time, Talia had trapped Batman in a locked safe sunk deep beneath Gotham Harbor. This ensured that even though he'd inevitably escape, Bruce wouldn't be able to reach another of his sons in time. Instead, the saving of the day was left to Damien, the fifth and still current Robin. Fighting desperately against a much stronger clone of himself, Damien held his own valiantly as he battled not only for his life but Gotham itself. Mother, call off your monster, he whispered from the ground as he was battered by the heretic. Still, the onslaught continued. Damien fought well past his considerable physical limits, but the heretic seemed utterly unstoppable. Eventually, Damien fell to his mother's monster, being impaled on the end of the heretic's sword. When Batman finally reached the scene, he cradled his son's limp body in his arms and couldn't even find the strength to stand. Number 1. Failed Jason Todd But above all the rest, of all the mistakes and catastrophes that have scarred Batman's life over the years, there was none greater and of more personal tragedy than the death of the second Robin, Jason Todd. After Dick Grayson left the role of Robin, Batman was naturally on the lookout for someone who could replace Dick as his partner and rekindle the dynamic duo. Bruce found that someone when he met a young Jason Todd stealing the tires off the Batmobile one night. Jason struck Bruce as a smart, slightly rebellious young firebrand and soon enough Jason was training to become the next boy wonder. However, as fate would have it, Jason Todd was very close to being Batman's very last partner. When the burgeoning Robin was taken captive by the Joker, Batman flew into action to find his second son before any harm could befall him. Unfortunately, Bruce was far too late for that. The Joker hid Robin away and beat the child mercilessly with a crowbar in an act of such pure hatred and abject cruelty that the Joker also came away forever changed by the event. As Batman closed in on their position, the Joker set a bomb to detonate at just the right moment. Though Jason very nearly escaped with his life, the young vigilante wouldn't be so lucky. As Batman finally approached the warehouse where Jason was being held, the entire building went up in a gigantic inferno. When Batman finally found Jason's broken, bloodied body amongst the ash and rubble of the building, he carried it away silently from the scene in what is now one of the most iconic images of the Dark Knight of all time. For Batman, no failure would ever sting quite so deep or ache as terribly as his failure to save Jason Todd. Bruce's relationship with every subsequent partner, sidekick, and ally he ever worked alongside would be colored by his memory of carrying the corpse of his second child away from a burning building he wasn't able to reach in time. Though there are many, including even Jason himself, who would point to other failings as the Dark Knight's worst moment, this moment, the scene of a grieving father holding the son he was unable to save is undoubtedly Batman's biggest regret. His greatest failure, his eternal sorrow, burned into his brain right alongside another memory, the memory of two parents being gunned down in a darkened alley. So what did you think of our list? Were there any other of Bat's biggest mistakes that didn't make this list? Let us know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching to the end of this video, and on behalf of all of us here at Plot Armor Comics, we hope you have an excellent day.